This is a story of a canal, a story of politics and ethics. Destroyed towns, violence, and torture. A story of passion and apathy, and progress versus conservation. This is a story of Florida. The Oklawaha, the sweetest water lane in the world. A lane which runs for more than 150 miles of pure delight betwixt hedgerows of oaks and cypresses and palms and bays and magnolias and mosses and manifold vine growths. A lane clean to travel along, for there is never a speck of dust in it, save the blue dust and gold dust which the wind blows out of the flags and lilies. A lane which is as if a typical wood stroll had taken shape, and as if God had turned into water and trees the recollection of some meditative ramble through the lonely seclusion of his own soul. I think the Cross Florida Barge Canal is one of the greatest boondoggles that has ever been perpetrated on the Florida public and the United States public. We need a barge canal across this beautiful state about as much as we need five holes in our heads. The Cross Florida Barge Canal was envisioned as a 107 mile long canal stretching from the St. Johns River in Jacksonville to the Withlacoochee Bay. In other words, reaching from the Atlantic to the Gulf, the canal would literally cut the state in half. Its purpose was to save travel time for commercial shipping. The canal would shave three days off maritime trips around Florida. This idea was floated as early as the 16th century, when Florida was a Spanish territory and the world was navigated by ships, and peninsulas were often seen as obstacles. But it wasn't until the 1930s that ideas became material plans, and soon a Florida Canal Authority was created. Since national unemployment was at 25% in 1935, it was easy for the canal to become part of Franklin Roosevelt's economic recovery plan. Five million dollars of emergency funds were allocated and thousands of men were sent to Florida to build the canal. With labor comes labor organizers. George Timmerman was a labor organizer who arrived in Ocala to make sure laborers were being treated fairly. Within two days, Timmerman was found in the woods, nailed to a cross. Timmerman's assailants, eager to send a clear and intimidating message, had sewn his lips shut. Mr. Timmerman was not the only casualty of the early days of the canal. In the 1930s, the African-American town of Santos, just south of Ocala, was completely destroyed to make way for the canal. Three churches, two general stores, a barber shop, post office, schoolhouse, and three juke joints all went down. But construction on the canal never happened in Santos. In fact, when the funds dried up only a year after it had begun, canal construction stopped. In 1942, the SS Gulf America was torpedoed by this German U-boat off the coast of Jacksonville. Due to the merchant ship carrying a hundred barrels of oil, civilians watched from the shore as the ship burnt for two days. Nineteen of the 48 crew were killed and the ship sunk to the ocean, where it remains. Not long after, the lights of the boardwalk were blamed for the attack. Jacksonville Governor Spesser Hollard immediately declared a strict shoreline blackout to prevent future torpedoing. Along with the shoreline blackouts, interest in restarting the construction on the canal grew in the name of national security. It wasn't until the 60s that construction would actually be revived. President Johnson arrived in Palatka, Florida for the groundbreaking. This time, concerns about saltwater infiltrating Florida's aquifer were addressed by introducing a system of locks and dams across the state. The 
the state and federal agencies involved unanimously agreed upon one route, one plan, a toll-free, lock-type, shallow-draft barge canal, higher than sea level. It will run atop the water-bearing strata rather than cutting down through this strata to sea level. The route has an abundance of water and requires the least amount of excavating by making maximum use of natural waterways. It seems like a good compromise. The aquifer would stay safe and progress in Florida would still be made. One woman from Micanopy, Florida had the guts to see through this. Born and raised in Bonita Springs, Florida by naturalist parents, Marjorie Harris Carr understood Florida ecology and how important and unique it was. Not to mention her husband, Archie Carr, a UF professor and world-renowned sea turtle biologist. After getting her bachelor's degree in zoology from the Florida State College for Women, now Florida State University, Marjorie became the first woman in the United States to be a wildlife technician. She got her master's degree in zoology from the University of Florida in 1942. good at what she did, influential, um, uh, loved by a lot of people. Um, she intimidated you know, a lot of people in agencies. But she was a very positive woman. And she never, I have to say this about my, both my parents, and I wish I were more like this, that there was no self-pity, no resentment, no backbiting, no gossip. You know, they weren't perfect people by any stretch of the imagination, but those aspects of them, I, I never, they did not have. I never heard mother slight or say anything awful, tatty, about all those people that she worked with with the barge canal. By the time the barge canal gained momentum in the mid-1960s, Marjorie was living in Micanopy, Florida, right outside of Gainesville. News of the Barge Canal was shocking to her and her family, but Marjorie was not the type of person to sit idly by. She took action in 1969, creating the Florida Defenders of the Environment, or FDE for short. The FDE was a conservation group made up of professors, lawyers, and biologists that was meant to oppose the Barge Canal using facts, studies, and tangible evidence of the harm that the canal would cause. You have initially changed the whole geomorphology of a river or a system of rivers, the way they drain, how much fresh water there is and where the fresh water goes. By looking at other canals, we would have figured out that we would have lost a lot of our bottomland hardwood swamps that clean the water and even affected our estuaries at the Gulf and the Atlantic. And estuaries are where the majority of our nation's seafood has its infancy. So they're vital to any seafood industry. So now you've removed the morphology of the river, you've lost the water cleansing properties of hundreds of miles of swamp, and then you change the river morphology and it's getting dredged, so it's silty. And then you're losing the bottom of the food chain. So you're losing the invertebrates that feed all the other fish. And so it becomes a cascade, it's not just fragmentation or one simple or easy word. And then what happens when ships need to get bigger, bigger than we thought they would have been in the 60s. So then you're enlarging and you're having to move more water and you're having to shift the water. As we've seen a lot of port systems like the Great Lakes with ballast and bilge comes exotics from other country in that water. So now you have things that have a a zebra mussel got into the Great Lakes. So we don't know, we can't even imagine what invasives would be here, and then even the invasives that are at the Gulf and the Atlantic, where they would have entry into the inland waters. In 1970, the FDE filed suit against the Army Corps of Engineers, who were the spearhead of the Barge Canal. What followed was 12 months of hearings and meetings with Marjorie even calling up President Richard Nixon on his private phone to discuss the effects of the canal. In January of 1971, President Nixon halted further construction on the Cross Florida Barge Canal, 
saying that building it would cause serious environmental damage. Stopping the Barge Canal stopped the destruction of the Ocklawaha River. By the time the canal was stopped, it was about 25% complete, including the complete construction of the Rodman Dam, which to this day prevents the Ocklawaha River from flowing freely. Despite the major victory, the idea wasn't dead, and the FDE, led by Marjorie for the next 30 years, would continue to fight not only for the restoration of the Ocklawaha River, but also numerous other environmental issues. The Cross Florida Barge Canal was officially dismantled in the late 90s, but as mentioned before, the issue of Rodman Dam continues to this day. The Rodman Dam is also called the Kirkpatrick Dam, after Senator George Kirkpatrick. Kirkpatrick was one of the most outspoken supporters of keeping the dam intact after the halt in construction on the Barge Canal. Many supporters of the dam, including Kirkpatrick, bring up the point that the dam has created an environment known as Rodman Reservoir that is a very popular recreation area. Kirkpatrick would always talk about how the bass fishing at Rodman was the best bass fishing in the world. He's right. It's incredibly easy to catch fish when they have nowhere to go. Today, remnants of the canal have been converted into a Cross Florida Greenway, appropriately called the Marjorie Harris Carr Cross Florida Greenway. This structure is a land bridge and recreation area that passes over several major highways in the state. In addition to over 300 miles of trails to utilize, the Greenway also allows bears and other animals to cross busy highways easily and safely. In the end, the story of the Cross Florida Barge Canal is one of Florida's most important stories. It goes beyond the Ocklawaha River and fighting for what you believe in, and brings to light the struggle Florida faces of preservation versus progress. Florida has always had this issue and probably will for the foreseeable future. What do you do with a place like this? There is nowhere else in the world that has an ecological makeup like Florida does. So what happens next? Do we exploit it? Use it for economic gain? Or preserve it? <laughs>